Welcome, everyone, and uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, Professor Muhammad Fadl. We're just waiting for people to join us, and it'll be a couple of minutes. I think people are coming into our room right now, uh, into the webinar, and we're broadcasting on Facebook. Uh, so if you are able to share it from your side, by all means, uh, we really look forward to having a, a rich and uh, enjoyable discussion. It's been uh, Really, sometimes that I wanted to have uh, Professor Fadl with me, and uh, this is a good opportunity. I just saw the picture of him trying to get uh, acquainted, like many of us, uh, on teaching <laughs> Zoom. Uh, so, well, <laughs> that was kind of a humorous picture. It wasn't meant to be too serious. But... Well, that's what it is. I, I said to my students that these days you have to be both a professor and a techie because you have to navigate. <laughs> Uh, the landscape of uh, online education. Uh, so welcome everyone, Assalamu alaikum. This is Dr. Hatem Bazian from the Islamophobia Research and Documentation Project at UC Berkeley and uh, Ethnic Studies. And this is part of our ongoing conversations uh, with uh, individuals, contributors, scholars, uh, uh, um, activists, and a whole variety of issues. We started this back uh, when shelter in place uh, occurred, and uh, we've been at it for some time. Uh, just to give you a short intro for our guest today, uh, Professor Muhammad uh, Fadl is a full professor at the University of Toronto, uh, Faculty of Law. Uh, professor Fadl wrote his PhD dissertation uh, a while ago on legal process in medieval Islamic law while at the University of Chicago. Uh, he, received, he received his GD from the University of Virginia School of Law. He has published numerous articles in Islamic legal history, Islam and liberalism, and Islam and finance. And, uh, for those who are attending the webinar with us, I put access to his articles from the Social Science Research Network, please you can access it, as well as on Toronto uh, University uh, law School, the faculty uh, page, you could access it there. Uh, follow him on Twitter as well. Uh, this is a way for us to have, I consider uh, Professor Fadl as a public intellectual that he is engaged in writing, but also uh, contributed in a variety of ways. So welcome and uh, thank you for being with us today. It's my great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for this kind invitation. Great. So uh, the, uh, the question to just get us going, I saw your piece on uh, Islamic uh, law and uh, universal basic income. I know this, this discussion about universal basic income has been bubbling for quite some time, both negative and positive. And to get us uh, maybe grounded, how do you actually, how did you view it from the vantage point of Islamic law? And then we could speak about the specifics of universal basic income. Right, well, I mean, I don't wanna say that Islamic law has a concept of universal basic income. But I think Islamic law has a lot of rules regarding distributive justice that I think overlap with the concerns of at least some of the justifications for universal basic income. Um, although I think that the concerns that Islam has for di distributive justice are much broader than I think the concerns that have um, made UBI so prominent in today's discourse. So today, I think a lot of people are worried, like, um, you know, if we take the most prominent example, Andrew Yang, he's very concerned that as automation spreads, people won't be able to find jobs. And so we're just gonna have to give them kind of a stipend so that they can live, like he calls it a freedom dividend, mm. right? Um, and so the impetus for UBI, for him and lots of other people is that, unemployment is going to be structural and growing or underemployment is going to be structural and growing by virtue of, of you know, all the advances we're making in production in the economy, that we just don't need human beings to do work anymore. So if that's the case, then how are people gonna live, right? So we're gonna have to give them money. I think in uh, Islamic law, the theory is a little different. Uh, I think the idea is more based on the dignity of the individual, hmm. that human beings, just simply by being human beings, should be guaranteed enough to survive, hmm. right? Without having to do anything, right? True. So people shouldn't be forced to sell their labor in order to survive. Hmm. 
And so Islamic law has, distribu has different mechanisms of distributive justice or re to redistribute wealth in society uh, to accomplish that. How, what are some of these mechanisms that are there and how they at least put them into practice? Right, the so the most, important, the most important institution was what's known as zakat. Mm -hmm. So zakat is one of the, the five pillars of Islam, right? So it's, it's, it's an obligation on every adult Muslim. Well, actually, it's, it's, I mean, there's a difference of opinion among the jurists. The mo most jurists say it's an obligation based on the wealth, right? Not just, not just um, adults, right? So if, if a child is an orphan, let's say, and inherited a lot of money from his, from his father or his mother or whatever, um, he too, that money, he, Zakat has to be, must, must be paid on that money as well, right? Even though as a child, he's not subject to legal, legal obligations, but the money is subject to legal obligations. So Islamic law, I don't want to get into all the boring details. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the jurists divided, you know, the, the pro, you know, identified different kinds of property and they taxed them differently. But generally the idea was that any person um, who had a amount of wealth or property that exceeded a certain threshold had to pay a certain amount above that threshold. And that money was then used to fund various public purposes. But the most important public purposes was to relieve poverty, hmm. right? And so um, the Quran specifies who can receive zakat. So there's two things. There's, you know, you collect the money on one side, you collect the zakat, and then you spend it. Mm -hmm. So uh, zakat is collected on, let's say, excess wealth, wealth that is beyond what one needs to survive. And then it's given to people who don't have enough to survive. And this is where I think it, the, the definitions, at least as you find in the, among the later, uh, later jurists, are very interesting in which they say um, any person who doesn't have enough savings, you know, the, uh, enough wealth uh, to meet his needs for a year is entitled to receive this, this zakat money. Mm. Right. So, and they even say that even if he owns enough to be subject to zakat, mm, right, yeah. but it's not enough to meet his needs for a year, he's still entitled to take money from the treasury. Right. Sure. Now, I'm not saying that Muslims were perfect in implementing this. I don't know. I can't get in the time machine and go back and see how well it was practiced. But we study law. One reason we study law is particularly historical systems of law, is to understand the aspirations of a society, of a particular society. So when you look at Islamic law and you see the institution of zakat and you see what it's trying to do, you can say clearly that the aspiration of Islamic law is to provide every single person with uh, a guarantee of his basic needs, hmm. right? Now, I think this is a very important for the, for very important from the perspective of human dignity because it's one thing to be lucky like me where I do a job that I love and I do it because I love it and I'm fortunate enough where it pays me a decent salary, right? True. Um, but most of us, most human beings, don't do jobs that they like. <laughs> most people work because they're forced to work because mm -hmm. if they don't work, they will starve. Right. And so when a human being has to sell his or her labor to survive, they're exposed to all sorts of risks to their dignity. They do things that they otherwise would not want to do. Right. Uh, employers can abuse them, can exploit them in all sorts of ways um, that is inconsistent with their well-being. And that's why, of course, we have or we at least in the United States and Canada and other advanced market economies, there are lots of laws that are designed to protect workers from potential exploitation. Now, again, lots of these laws aren't enforced, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But one of the reasons we need these laws is because we recognize that workers are in a position that they're vulnerable, they can be exploited by their employers because if they don't do what their employers tell them, they fear they'll, they'll lose their job 
and particularly in a place like the United States, you know, literally be thrown out on the street, right? No, you touch. So, no, no, go ahead. And so that's what I'm saying. I think the UBI, regardless of whether it's good economic policy or not, I mean, because I think there are a lot of debates among economic economists about how much it would cost, what would the impact be for, you know, productivity, et cetera, et cetera. I think from the perspective of human rights and human dignity, it's a clear win because the workplace would be radically, nothing would transform the workplace more radically than a situation where a worker is not forced to work to avoid starvation, where a worker is not forced to work to avoid being thrown out of his home, et cetera. Right. Now you mentioned, so, you mentioned at least um, in both earlier and this, the concept of dignity. And mm -hmm. you know that uh, in the debate about uh, universal basic income, there's this assumption that if you give people money, they're going to be lazy. It strips them from the dignity and so on. So how did, at least from an Islamic perspective, uh, how that actually giving people zakat, their needs, fulfilling their uh, human rights of food, shelter, and so on, really should not be conflated with really not encouraging people to work in order to earn a living, because that's one of the major critique that is put forward these days. Yeah, I, I, I find that argument to be really, really puzzling. Because as I said, I'm lucky I get to do a job that I love, right? True. Um, I'm sure you get to do a job you love. People in academic, I mean, that's one of the best things about being an academic is we generally really love our jobs. Uh, I don't think that most people can say that. When I practice law in New York, you know, lots of lawyers are not very happy with their jobs, mm. with their lives. And, and they're, they've got relatively good jobs, right? So I don't know what we would say about people who are working, um, you know, on a factory all day long, right? Marx right, you know, Mm -hmm. He wrote a lot about alienation and, sure. and, the, and how um, the assembly line process leads to the uh, cretinization of workers. Mm -hmm. right? That's his expression. Um, and so I think there is a lot of dignity in work if it is done freely. Mm. But when somebody is forced to work in order to avoid starvation or avoid poverty or avoid these other kinds of things, I'm not sure why we think there's a lot of dignity in that. Right? I think it seems to be the opposite of that, right? Um, you know, you hear stories of people who have to commute several hours both ways to get to a low paying job because the salary they're being paid working at a fast food place or a Walmart or whatever is not enough to allow them housing in a, in a location relatively close by. So they live two hours away or something mm. like that, right? I mean, I've personally seen people and known people like that, right? Um, and so I'm not sure where the dignity lies in that, right? And I think, so the Islamic view, I think, is a little different. Again, now we're moving away from zakat. But mm -hmm. if we look at the laws governing employment of labor in Islamic law, mm -hmm. jurists were always skeptical of employment contracts. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a lot of formal reasons why they were skeptical. But I think the true reason they were skeptical of employment contracts was because of precisely this risk that people are being forced to sell themselves uh, in order to, to survive. So it's a kind of slavery, mm -hmm. right? Because you're selling your labor output. So um, jurists placed a lot of conditions before an employment contract was considered to be binding. And if those contracts, if those conditions were not satisfied, then it became what was known as, you know, essentially an at-will contract. And the employee could leave whenever she wanted, right? Mm -hmm. If the work just was too much or she didn't like it or whatever, she could just quit and go home. Because if there were a binding contract in principle and theory, the employer could force the worker, could call on the judge to seize the worker and bring him back, mm -hmm. right? And if, if you look at the history of, uh, of, capitalist societies and post-industrial revolution, particularly England and the United States, workers oftentimes were, were forced to perform their employment contracts. Mm -hmm. They could go to jail if they didn't perform their employment contracts, right? 
um, I mean, we, we've gone away from that in modern American law, right? Where typically we do not require workers to perform their contract. If they, if they breach their contract, then an employer can have other remedies, but typically an employer can no longer get an order forcing a worker to work, right? But that wasn't the case in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. But in Islamic law, generally speaking, it was very hard for an employer um, to be able to compel a worker to work, right? And the reason for that, I think generally speaking, is that they viewed that as a way, as, a, as, as degrading to the, to the worker, right? And so, in fact, you would still say, like, some jurists, they, well, there's this principle in Islamic law that a believer does not degrade himself. Mm. And they view typically the employer con the employee contract as a kind of degrading relationship because you are subject to the control of another person. But it was permitted for necessity because human life requires cooperation and a division of labor. And so um, employment contracts were allowed for necessity, but highly regulated to minimize the amount of exploitation that's, that's, uh, that, that this relationship creates. Yeah. Well, I, I, as you know, in the US, uh, Canada, and uh, UK, uh, the notion of uh, providing somebody with money without labor is uh, critiqued as being part of the left, part of uh, communist agenda. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, again, attacks on it on this way. But the same argument is not made for subsidizing the wealthy and subsidizing corporations. So it seems that in here is much more of how really are attacking the idea without looking at its vi viability in the market to address the issue of dignity and the issue of labor. Uh, because the question again from Marx, what, who has the right to the surplus of the workers' labor? And that yeah. still has not been really uh, completely adjudicated. Well, I, again, I think, you know, our attitudes, I, you know, um, have changed a lot. Uh, Lord Keynes in the, you know, first half of the 20th century, mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously he's a giant economist. Um, he was looking around the world and he was seeing all this technological <clears throat> progress. And he and many of the economists of his generation thought that because of economic progress, we were, because of technological progress, human beings would be enjoying a windfall of leisure. Mm -hmm. That we would, be, we would be freed from the burdens of labor. And then we could actually do things that we wanted to do that made us better human beings, right? Um, and I think that's probably, when you think about it, a lot more sensible of an idea. I mean, why is it that if we live in a world where we can have robots produce everything, why should we be sad that we don't require human beings to sit there and do repetitive tasks eight hours a day, 40, 40 hours a week? Shouldn't we celebrate the fact that now these human beings could maybe spend more time studying philosophy or studying religion or studying political science or poetry or whatever like that? But in order to do that, you have to be able to reallocate the surplus from production to everyone in society, not just those who own it, mm. right? I mean, this is the problem, um, again, which, which Marx kind of identifies. But there's no reason why in an age where productivity is more and more a function of machines that we have to force people to work at jobs that they don't like. So just a simple example. Um, the number of people who work in the McDonald's today is a lot less than when I was a kid. And the reason is that McDonald's has a lot more automation in it, mm. right? So normally we say that's a good thing because now instead of having 25 people slaving away, you've got just five or six. Um, now we have a social problem because we have no way of giving resources to those 20 people. But that's a political social problem. It's not, a, it's not an economic problem, right? Sure. I mean, the same level of production is being achieved. If we would just be willing to transfer them resources, then they could be doing something very valuable with their lives. But having this kind of 
fixation or fetishization of the need to sell your labor to be productive, I think limits our capacity to be imaginative in this scenario. Take advantage of the kind of opportunities automation should be giving us. And, and one other thing in this regard, I think, um, I would be opposed to a universal basic income that gives more than, let's say, a, um, a subsistence level to everybody. So this is another thing that, that I would say from the, the, Islamic, the Islamic law's view of this, is that while everybody should be entitled to a minimum level, right? It mm -hmm. is a minimum level, right? It should be enough to satisfy their, their, their daily needs, but it shouldn't be so much that at some point in time, yes, it would affect incentives, right? But what I'm trying to suggest is that universal basic income, if it's set at the appropriate level, where you, know, you don't have the choice, you're not put between the draconian choice of working, at, let's say, in a fast food restaurant or starving or being homeless, right? Mm. Then that would radically transform the workplace. It would force places like McDonald's, Walmart, all these other sort of low end, low wage businesses to radically change the way they interact with their workforce, right? Because mm -hmm. they can't, they could no longer exploit their desperation. Right? So people might suddenly find work to be dignifying if it's work that they enjoy and work that respects them rather than work that they're forced to do, you know, just to survive, then they'll have a completely different experience of what work is. Maybe I could add a little bit to, uh, we spoke about the issue of dignity, but also it seems that many who are engaging or talking about uh, universal basic income in opposing it, they have an attitude that really comes from a reading of Darwinianism in terms of survival of the fittest, seeing that if you give to those who are less able, that is somehow you are rigging an, a natural order rather than thinking these are adopted perspectives that people have adopted uh, over the past 200 plus years. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I haven't read huge amounts of the, 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 the literature that criticizes universal basic income. I'm much more familiar with like, somebody like Paul Krugman, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, who is hardly you know, a, a, a right-wing economist. I mean, his objections are sent essentially that for it to make a difference, it would cost too much. But right? this is also the assumption that if you actually put liquidation in the market, it actually creates uh, a positive uh, d distribution and a positive well, factors in the market overall. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not an economist. I'm just saying yeah. his objections are more that you know, it's, it's either going to cost too much or do too little, right? And yeah. so it's better, it's better to focus spending on people who need it. Now, again, I'm not sure technically how it would work. Um, I mean, I think what it would work is if somebody like me, if I get this universal basic income, it would just increase my overall income and then I would be taxed and it would go back to the government. So I, I understand the, the, the objection. Why would we give money to people who don't need it? Isn't it better just to give money to the people who need it? Um, I guess, except that oftentimes there are, there are administrative costs associated with that. Also, in when, when a program is limited to just a small group of people, it makes it politically difficult sometimes to sustain that program because there are not enough not people who will fight for it in Congress, et cetera. Um, I mean, the, the, there are lots of sort of detail, devil in the details, as they kind of say. Um, but this notion, I think, on the right that there's a kind of virtue out there in uh, the struggle for social survival. Um, and that's sort of played out in a laissez-faire workplace. Um, again, I just don't see that to be... Or the success theology that has been also intertwined in it. That Right. Yeah, I, I just don't see what the, what the appeal of that is to people, right? I mean, um, you know, if we were living in some kind of 
uh, desert island where we had no means to take care of everybody, um, maybe it would really be very important to have no holes barred competition because we don't have enough resources for everybody. So we want to make sure that I guess those who are best able to contribute are rewarded. Uh, I just don't see that in a society of mass affluence, mm -hmm. right? A society in which, gosh, there's so much excess savings that interest rates are negative. Mm. I mean, you can't pay people to borrow money, right? There's just so much excess. So in a world like that, why would we want to be stingy? Mm. Right. It just seems, it just seems so kind of, 17th century. Well, we're stingy on certain things. Again, if you want to uh, fund the military industrial complex, you never have a lack of resources. I never yes, tell them that they don't have any money. That's or if true. you want to have a rescue package for corporations, there is no, what you call it, it's a bottomless bit for it. But when it comes for human needs, we get all these walls and impediments that are put in there. And for me, again, is that uh, specifically relative to the Muslim part, it, that Muslims begin to actually argue their point of view, not from an Islamic uh, foundation or understanding, they begin to reflect or well, right way. Yeah. I mean, uh, state there is, I mean, we have to be clear, right? Um, I think Islamic law, and I'll just speak about Islamic law, not other, not sort of yeah. Islam comprehensively, right? You can't say that it's, um, there are important distributive institutions in Islamic law. Mm -hmm. But Islamic law also recognizes private property, sure. right? It also recognizes private, pri the, the pursuit of profit, um, that the profit is legitimate in the proper circumstance. So I think Islamic law tries to pursue both avenues, right? It encourages a vibrant private sector but at the same time, it also requires redistribution. And one of the aspirations of redistribution is that no one in society um, has to worry about basic needs being met, right? And so what, I, what I'm talking about- Which include about, again, I'm, I'm, food, uh, shelter, food, shelter, water, clothing, uh, Yes. Right. Energy, again, the, the, the three and elements that the so prophet spoke about. I think we, we can put these two things together and you can think about a market in some ways as being, ha the, the, there's, a, there's a market failure. I'm going to use an economics term. Mm -hmm. One could say there's a, a failure of the market if the participants in the market don't have a certain guaranteed baseline because then they will enter into transactions that are from a certain perspective, suboptimal, right? Because they're not actually, the, the price at which they're willing to sell their labor is not their, the actual price that they would demand, mm -hmm. but it's the demand that they're being forced to accept because they lack these other things, right? So maybe you would have a more complete market in, an econo in the economic sense, right? A more perfect market. If everyone in that entering the market is guaranteed a certain minimum before they even enter the market. So what I would say, again, from the Islamic perspective is that we need the market, but we also need to guarantee that everybody who participates in the market, all of us, is able to do so without fear that, you know, failure is going to create some sort of existential crisis. Hmm. This lecture continues on CD number nine. What? Okay. <sighs> Sorry, I don't know what happened there. That's okay. Uh, My phone I'm... started speaking on its own. Um, so, so, go ahead about the uh, so, thought you know, that you were... <clears throat> I mean, again, uh, when it comes to distribution in Islamic law, not everything has to go to the poor, mm. right? So there are ideas about public goods uh, and you, and according to the jurists, you could give private persons certain licenses, 
mm. or let's say, uh, to exploit public resources for the on the theory for the public good. I mean, so you know, one 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 obvious example is public lands, mm -hmm. which is the masha. If there's a if there's a mine or something like some sort of natural resource, the state could award a license to a private person to develop that mine, right? And the state would take a, a tax, but the rest would go to the private person. So um, while Islam has a very strong redistributionist element, right? It also allows for private activity and private wealth accumulation. Um, and so we all, I, I don't like to take strongly ideological positions. Um, I think uh, we're just trying to at least give some notions of what Islamic law, uh, at least in thinking about universal basic income, yeah. what Islamic law allows or doesn't allow, but also the other pieces. For example, what is the role of waqf and is waqf an institution that plays a role in the distributive aspect of Islam and how those institutions that are managed at a private, at a local level have played such a role in addressing the basic needs of people. Yeah, that's an excellent, you bring up the exact excellent example of the waqf. So um, in the, up until the 19th century, one way Muslim governments redistributed um, social wealth was through this institution of waqf. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could think of a waqf at least these public walks as a kind of municipal corporation. And so these municipal corporations were given beneficial ownership of various productive assets in the economy. And so instead of the taxes flowing to the central government, the tax revenue would flow to this municipal corporation that would then distribute it according to specified ends in the charter of that what I said, that walk slash municipal corporation, mm -hmm. right? Um, so those were very important uh, means of redistribution of, of public income. And what, what, one thing that's very interesting about these walks that were very, very common throughout the Middle East was that, you know, zakat was always viewed as a religious obligation. It was limited, the duty was limited to Muslims and only Muslims could take advantage of it. But the revenues of the zakat of, of, of al qaf they were pu completely 100% public. Um, everybody could take a benefit, could benefit from the waqf, right? It was not limited to Muslims or any particular religion. These were just general public revenues. Anybody who was a beneficiary, any member of the public who otherwise met the conditions could take advantage of it and could use it. So they were very important, and for their time, they were very efficient means of redistributing social wealth to less fortunate members of society. Uh, maybe I'll ask another question in relation to the view how Islamic law and Islam in general viewed the poor. It mm -hmm. seems that these days in our modern society, we blame the poor for their state of poverty. And that, if that's the uh, view of the poor, then certain actions and uh, policies relate to how the poor is situated in the society. How did the Muslims uh, or how Islamic law is so and posited relative to the poor and opposite also those who are affluent in Islamic societies right. in the past? Well, I mean, I think there are a couple of different ways we can approach this. I mean, from a theological perspective, I think uh, generally Muslims viewed wealth or poverty um, as something that was unearned, right? That God decreed our provisions for us. Some people are wealthy, some people are poor, and it's not because of anything that they did or did not do to deserve that, right? And from this the greater theological perspective, um, you know, whether you're rich or poor, you have certain obligations of gratitude toward God, of of, of, of um, your solidarity with other human beings, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. um, likewise, from a legal perspective, you were entitled to get zakat if you were poor without having to prove 
that you're incapable of working, hmm. right? So there's no, there's no means testing. There's no saying, oh, why don't you go get that job? You have to show me that there's no job available for you before I give you any assistance, which is oftentimes the case today in the United States because they ended welfare as, as we know it, right? So now if you're able-bodied, presumably you're not entitled to welfare. Go out and find a job. So Islamic law clearly repudiated that. It said that even if you are capable of working, you still are, and, but you're poor, you still can have zakat. But on the other hand, there's always another, hand, it mm -hmm. did want to encourage people to be productive. I'm talking about law here. Yes. So even though theologically we say that we are not responsible for our fortune because you know, God gives us, God deprives us, and we have to be grateful in either situation as a theological matter, as a legal matter, um, the jurists are concerned that the law gives people incentives to be productive. Mm -hmm. So again, if we look at Zakat, one of the features of the law of Zakat was encouraging investment. So you would not be subject, your property is not subject to Zakat unless you've owned it for a year. Hmm. In other words, you've had, you've had the opportunity to make it productive, right? Sure. Um, and for example, if you are a cultivator, if you're a farmer, and you provide irrigation for your land, as opposed to it being irrigated by rain, right? You have a lower rate. So if it's rain-fed agriculture, I think it's 10%, mm -hmm. but if it's an aquifer that you dig, it's 5%. Yes. So um, I, I think Islamic law tries to synthesize, create, uh, you know, arrive at some, some kind of middle position that includes guaranteeing basic subsistence for everybody, while at the same time providing incentives for people to acquire. So I wanted to actually um, move to another subject, not in relation to in international basic, in, uh, universal basic income, but your article about the uh, economies of the Middle East that just came out recently it was a short piece about what you consider there that the Middle East in general in its post-colonial frame uh, has in essence been left behind uh, in relations to its economies and how the economies then develop. So where do you see the development in the region in from the economic perspective? Oh gosh, that's a you know, I'm not an. I, I, it's not an economic. I think you. It's pointed well, to something which is again. I, I was thinking about in relations to uh, a, the Arab world or Muslim world, common market, uh, cooperative relationship in the region. It seems that all that is non-existent, which keeps. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the problem that you have in the Arab world is you have this contradiction between population poor, but capital rich countries, i.e. the Gulf, where you have very low populations, countries like Qatar, UAE, Kuwait, um, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, uh, but have huge amounts of oil wealth, more than they know what to do with, mm. right? because their local economies can't absorb all the revenue that their oil economies have generated. So this generates massive amounts of surplus that has to be invested abroad because there's no other place to put it, right? Now, for political reasons, well, excuse me, let me do one other thing. Then you have other countries in the region, like Egypt, the countries of the Levant, Iraq, Etc. Lebanon that are that are rich in human beings. I either they have high populations, but very low amounts of savings. So, in a rational world, right, they would cooperate with each other, because the Gulf countries have excess financial capital. They need places to invest it. These other countries are human rich, capital poor. So they have lots of opportunities for investment, right? 
So they should, they should work together. But because the politics of the states in this region is authoritarian, mm. right? States pursue policies in the interest of the rulers and not the ruled, right? True. Um, and so the, the, the ruling class of the oil states are much more interested in preserving their power so they can monopolize use of the oil rents, mm. right? I mean, the, 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 the path that economists would call for, i.e. integration, mm -hmm. even though it makes more sense for everybody in the region, it undermines the powers of those who control the oil, right? Hence, mm. that's why in that essay I said, before this can happen, there has to be democratization. Mm -hmm. Because only if there were democratization would politics be accountable to the people, and then we could expect states to pursue rational economic policies as opposed to the self-serving policies that they pursue now. And one part of it is that the regional trade between countries is so limited that much of the trade occurs external to either the ex-colonial states or with major uh, trading partner outside, United States, China, India, and so on, which does not create the uh, economic synergies for the region, both from uh, those endowed with resources as well as those endowed with the human capital. Right. Well, I mean, again, a country like Egypt, um, it needs to have capital in order to compete effectively in the world market, right? And so it could get its capital from internal savings, but because it's a poor country, those savings aren't sufficient. So it has to get it from outside the country, right? Mm. But part of the problem, and this is another thing I was saying, is that um, you know you have the world today, quite in a way, quite contrary to the vision of the the, the GATT. I know most people don't like the GATT, but I, I like the GATT. Uh, um, the GATT was supposed to eliminate trading blocks. Yeah. So between World War I and World War II, you had trading blocks organized in these imperial systems. You had the British Empire, you had the French Empire, you had the Dutch Empire, um, the Japanese were trying to get their own empire. And most global trade happened within these empires. And so people like Keynes mm -hmm. and others thought that this was one of the biggest reasons that led to World War II, uh, because there wasn't free trade. And so after World War II, they wanted to create a, not, not a free trading system, but a liberalized trading system, take down barriers, allow countries to trade with each other on non-discriminatory terms, right? But what's happened is that countries have used what's known as the free trade area mm -hmm. to recreate trading blocks. So the EU is essentially a preferential trading bloc. NAFTA is a preferential trading bloc. Uh, the, 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 the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, you know, which I guess the United States hasn't joined, but I think it's sort of going through. That's another kind of trading bloc. So there are all these regional trading blocs of the greatest, you know, the biggest economies in the world, despite the fact that the, the, the spirit behind the GATT was to lower barriers between countries. Now, this has been particularly bad for the Arab world hmm. because the Arab world is not part of any large trading area. They're on their own. And this is also true for um, Sub-Saharan Africa as well. And it's very important for countries, developing countries, to be able to, there, there's only two ways they can develop. They can either develop through internal-led growth so they can import a lot of capital and then use it to develop their economy and sell goods domestically, right? Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, your domestic market has to be really, really, really large. So China, India. China, India can pursue domestic-led growth because you know, if I'm GM or I'm Ford or I'm Tesla, I'm happy to go set up a factory in China because there are a billion potential customers, right? But I would never consider doing so in Tunisia because there are only 5 million people. 
I would only set up in Tunisia if I can export from Tunisia to a larger market like the EU. But the problem is because of the EU, if I want to sell into the EU, I'm going to invest in the EU. I'm not going to invest in Tunisia and then export fr from Tunisia into the EU because Tunisia is outside of the trading zone, right? So countries like Tunisia are essentially locked out of the global economy because they're, they're, neither, they're, not, they're not part of any regional trading bloc. So what I was saying was that if the, if the post-Ottoman world, like mm. the countries that succeeded to the Ottoman Empire, were to form a, a federation like the EU, right, um, and include Iran, you would have a very large population. So that would make it worth, its, worth the while of companies like Tesla mm. to open up factories within that federation because they're such a big domestic market. And it would be big enough where they could negotiate on even uh, on the somewhat even, even playing field with countries in North America, like the United States, Canada, with the EU, with China, to allow them to export, make it easier to export to them. But as it is now, right, if you, you know, it's, it's almost inconceivable that Egypt or Tunisia or Jordan could ever be competitive in the global market in any kind of industrial product, right? At the same time, because of the peculiarities of the oil economy, right, mm -hmm. um, the Gulf countries could never become sort of uh, centers of production because it's just too expensive to do that there. Right, you would never again set up like large scale factories in the Gulf to export into Europe because labor will be too. I mean, it's very complicated stuff, but uh, yeah. uh, what would make sense for the region as a whole is for them to form a federation along the lines of the EU, right? That would allow for much more sustainable economic development over the long term. Right. So I'm going to take some of the questions that have been posted. Okay. And, uh, one person just said, how about mo uh, monetary sovereignty? How about monetary sovereignty? Uh, okay. What about monetary sovereignty? <laughs> so w what about it? So are, is it, uh, are you speaking about delinking the uh, currencies and the, and the, uh, monetary policies of each of the countries from the dollar or the major hard currency in the euro. Uh, what is it specific in terms of printing their own currencies without yeah, need to yeah. import capital? Yeah, I mean, look, you can, every country can print as much money as it wants. The problem is, will other people take it, right? So when I say a country, let's say Egypt needs to import capital, Egypt can't print, can't use its own currency to import foreign capital because let's say I'm Elon Musk and I want to, I want to set up a, a, a Tesla manufacturing plant, right? Um, or I want to sell my expertise to an Egyptian manufacturer to, to manufacture Teslas on license from me, right? I'm going to want to be paid in a currency that's useful to me. The Egyptian, Egyptian pound is not useful to me in the United States. Nobody will accept it, right? So it's irrelevant that the Egyptian government has the ability, has monetary sovereignty in the international market. It only, it's only relevant in the domestic market. But if you want to buy foreign capital, if you want to attract foreign capital, you have to be able to get foreign currency, at least right now. I mean, you know, the renminbi, China's currency, at one point in time, nobody wanted it. Hmm. But now, because China is the second largest economy in the world, foreigners conceivably would like to have renminbi because you can use it to do things. But, you know, what good is me having a million Egyptian pounds in, in the United States? Zero. Nobody wants it. Right? I can't use it to buy anything. <coughs> U.S. dollars anywhere in the world, they're valuable because people can use them to buy goods from the United States, which are highly desirable everywhere. Okay. There's another question that um, from George and it's a long question, so I'm going to read it and then we could see. 
Uh, he said, I am troubled by the entire discussion of dignity. Uh, all of your comments seems to flow from the notion that all humans share your system of values of what is worthy and what is not. Uh, this is completely contrary to the Islamic sense of values. Uh, God created individuals with a broad spectrum of resources, abilities, etc. The wealthy individual is expected to give lots. The poor are equally respected if they give pennies. Many, many people obtain a great sense of dignity from their performance of what you consider menial, boring, etc. Uh, some might say that your perspective summer suffers from a large dose of arrogance. Again, that's his statement. Your analysis would benefit from uh, a relook, acknowledging that many folks are perfectly satisfied to perform simple, repet repetitive tasks if it can earn them a reasonable income. Indeed, this type of job income is a very large portion of all economies. So again, uh, that's a question. So the notion of dignity and taking it possibly, uh, I, I think our, my question is with, uh, on dignity is uh, the critique that is often offered when the discussions about uh, helping and extending support for the poor that giving them free money, quote, to strip them of their dignity and their sense of self-worth. I don't think that myself or as understand uh, Professor Fadl, but he could speak for himself about yeah. the, the issue that we were discussing. Just I mean, to correct the framing. I don't know. I guess, it's, I guess it's possible that some people are perfectly happy and think that there's no problem in their dignity if they are getting paid minimum wage to clean people's cars. I mean, I, I guess that's possible, right? I don't know. But um, my intuition says that most people who do that, my intuition and my experience, most people do that because they don't find something better to do, right? And they, they have to have some sort of money. So the, the 19, and then, but more, more, more importantly, I don't really want to talk about my own intuitions and my own feelings. I was trying to represent um, what Muslim jurists have said about this point. So Ibn Abidin, who is a very famous 19th century um, Damascene jurist from the Hanafi school, said there's no greater servility than the servility entailed in somebody who humiliates himself to get money. Mm. That that's the worst form of servility that can happen to a human being when he or she does something that she really does not want to do because she needs money or not even because she needs money because she loves money or he loves money. Mm. Right. And so that's why they said that the love of money oftentimes makes humans servile, right? Because they will do things that degrade themselves because they're so in love with money. So at least from an Islamic perspective, some of our subjective desires are not good for us, right? Okay. And, and, and one of the ideas here, at least if we take these Islamic principles seriously, is that we might not know our true desires unless we live in a world where a certain minimum is guaranteed for everybody, where I don't have to worry about where I'll get my next meal, right? So maybe I'll only get only be in touch with my true desires when I live in that world. But as long as I don't live in that world, I'm constantly forced to do things just for survival. So there's a saying that's attributed to Ali ibn Abi Talib. I don't know if I don't know if it's valid or not. But uh, what's what's attributed to him is kad al faqru yakunu kufran. That poverty is almost the equivalent of atheism. And what he means by that, or I think what he means by that, is that people, when they're desperate, they lose their sort of moral restraint and they become more, um, they become less human as a result. So if that's the case, if you think that there's some wisdom in that, then we should for moral reasons, not economic reasons in the sense of productivity, but for moral reasons, for the, dig for the moral dignity of human beings, you know, try to get rid of poverty. Yeah. 
Uh, Chris has a question. He says, UPI will allow corporations to skirt increasing pay of, of employees uh, for another decade or two. Uh, why would not get corporations to pay fair wages and rates? Uh, this would benefit all poverty-stricken individuals regardless of country or region. UPI is another corporate bailout while the workers have not had a raise since 1979 adjusted for inflation. This is the problem. Poverty is the effect and it is, is, it's not this simple. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on um, second order consequences of UBI, uh, although I'm sure that a different causal relationship between UBI and wages could be made. For example, you know, if I'm guaranteed from the government an income of $18,000 a year, then presumably the minimum way, the minimum that a, an undesirable job would have to pay me would be at least that much, right? So, I mean, I don't know how much minimum wages, you know, in the United States, but if it's, if working full time at that does not get you to the UBI, then obviously it's gonna have to go up or else I'm not gonna be able to get workers. So it's not clear to me how that would affect the supply and demand curves in the employment market. Um, but generally speaking, I'm kind of suspicious of blanket demands that all employers raise wages to a certain level. Ultimately, the long run wages of any kind of business can only be sustainable if they're at a level that's consistent with the business's ability to make a profit. Um, and that's gonna be a function of the profitability of each firm. Some firms are barely profitable. So if you raise, if you force them to pay more money, then either they're going to go out of business or they're going to find a way to substitute machines for human beings. Um, so I would much rather have a background institution that guarantees everybody a certain wage outside of the labor market, prior to the labor market. Then that raises the holdout wage of everybody. So if I'm guaranteed a subsistence salary without me doing any kind of work, then obviously when I'm bargaining with my employer, I have a great, I have greater bargaining power and I'll be able to get, I would think a higher wage, but you know, maybe I, maybe I'm wrong on the way that works out. I'm not sure. But for me, it's mainly a question of the dignity of individuals. Um, I think we have a question here, which is a little bit long, but I'm going to sum it up to say in his book, Introduction to the Principle of Tafsir, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah outlines some of the mistakes people make when interpreting the Quran. He writes, the first problem which arose was people believing in certain ideologies and then interpreting the Quran to fit those ideologies. So I think what he's pointing, he says, I feel Muslims are doing, in essence, their they have a particular ideology and then they try to fit the Quranic interpretation or Islamic law into it. Again, the issue of um, universal basic income is something coming from outside Islam. So that's, I think, the just of what is uh, being in there. He says that they embrace leftist rhetoric or right-wing ideologies instead of grounding themselves in the normative teachings of Islam. Well, I mean, I don't know. You could always make that argument against everybody, right? I mean, if, if, if that's true, then it applies to everybody. Um, so you can always criticize somebody saying, oh, oh, that's not really a fair reading of Islamic sources. That is the, um, that's, the, uh, that's the Adam Smith in you reading the Quran, or that's the Karl Marx in you reading the Quran, or that's uh, the, um, the John... Jacques Rousseau in you reading the Quran, right? Or that's the uh, Plato in you reading Quran. Uh, the very, the, the simple reality is um, whenever we approach any kind of text, we're gonna be reading it through a combination of the subjective characteristics that we have as a reader, along with the objective characteristics of the text that we're reading. So, it's true, as somebody gains more and more education, in my opinion, they are going to be able to perceive deeper meanings 
in the Quran, in the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad, in, in Islamic law. But that doesn't mean they're forcing it there. It just shows that they have deeper insight. So I'll give an example here of Ibn Rushd, who was the great um, Muslim philosopher of Spain and also a great jurist and theologian, polymath. He, you know, he memorized Kitab al So um, these were people of great intellect, far surpassing you know, what we do today, when maybe they had nothing else to do but read. But in any case, he has this short book called Fasl al-Maqal fi ma bain al-hikmati wa sharia min at tasal in which he's, he's, it's a book in which he tries to say that, um, or tries to outline the unity of philosophy and revelation. And one of his points is that when somebody reads the Quran, their ability to understand it is going to depend on the level of their own intellect. So somebody who's never studied, right? When he or she reads the Quran, she's gonna understand it in, at one level. Somebody who has a higher level of education is going to be able to understand it in a different way. Somebody who has a sort of really deep philosophical scientific education is going to be able to understand things in yet another way. But those are all modes of communication that the Quran intends because Quran is universal. So if human beings have different capacities and different talents and different inclinations, the Quran has to speak to everyone. And that's one of the things that Ibn Rush says is so amazing about the Quran is that it has this capacity to speak to everyone of all different intellects. So I don't think there's this, that we can take seriously this idea that there's one meaning in the Quran that is independent of our own subjective characteristics, right? Our, subject sorry, our subjective characteristics are just as real as the true meaning of the Quran. We have a question from your side of the, uh, the continent from Ontario, possibly, uh, Ferial. She said, Ontario residents, parents, receive child credit, money they receive per child. For some of the people, it takes away the incentive to work, and they try to make do with this stipend they receive from the government, which, again, possibly contemplated that universal basic income will be, again, a de-incentivizing of people to work. Well, that's only true if you think taking care of children is not work, mm. right? I mean, taking care of children is work. Um, and again, in Islamic law, um, the hadin, the, the person taking care of the child, is entitled to be paid. Um, mm. That is a kind of work. Um, in fact, that's one of the reasons why the government in Canada gives credits is because they want parents to take care of their children, right? And they don't want them to work because they think it's valuable for the parent to supervise the child. So they compensate them for that by giving them, a, 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 by giving them money. So I'm not sure why that's a criticism because not everything that's as public as a social good has to be delivered by the market, right? Again, if you think that child care is a good thing, um, the market might not deliver it because uh, people will need to sell their labor to survive. If people need to sell their labor to survive, they're gonna neglect their children. Mm. So why not give people money so they don't have to go into the market while their children are young? That doesn't, I mean, doesn't seem to me a very yep. difficult problem to understand. Uh, another question that is, can be summed up, it, it seems that uh, in universal basic income and other elements is attempting to fix a symptom of the larger problem, which is uh, the whole capitalist economic system uh, that makes uh, distributive wealth an impossibility. Well, the market ha comes with advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of the market is it's very efficient in distributing scarce resources. The disadvantage of the market is that 
the outcomes are quite unfair, right? So somebody like Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, end up capturing massive amounts of wealth that are socially generated. The good thing about it is that we get Teslas, we get Windows, we get you know overnight delivery of all the things that we need, right? So um, we should never look at just the bad side of, of an institution. We also have to look at the good side, right? So the market is extremely efficient in allocating resources, but it's very bad in distributive justice. So what the modern sort of welfare economics approach is, is let the market do the market and then tax it and redistribute it. Now, I think that's very consistent in spirit with Islam's attempt to reconcile these two things. Now, the problem in the United States is very peculiar to the United States, that it's almost impossible to implement effective redistribution policy in the United States because our government, our federal government, is so structurally divided. Um, so you have a group of people, i.e. Republicans, who are ideologically opposed to any kind of redistribution. So you have an imperfect, a very imperfect implementation of welfare economics in the United States, where in theory, we should be taxing a lot higher. So people don't realize this. I mean, they think of like, like, um, uh, Bernie Sanders would always point out the Scandinavian model as something he'd like the United States to work towards. But what is the Scandinavian model? The Scandinavian model has a very efficient market economy. Like, for example, employers have a lot of rights to fire workers and things like that. But they have a very expansive social safety net. So they have both things. They have a very, very efficient market economy combined with very high rates of taxation and redistribution. But in the US, because of the peculiar features of our constitution, it makes it almost impossible to implement you know, meaningful redistribution. So we do much less redistribution than you know, countries like even Canada, or to say nothing of France or Germany or, or, the, or the Scandinavian countries. Um, last question I'll take is also, Chris, does your argument still hold up in monopolistic economy like the U.S., where elite industry leaders have arguably nullified the free market system through, through conglomeration? Uh, would UPI empower the worker uh, to not accept a low wage when diversity of, employ, uh, of employers and options are not there for them? So again, we're increasingly in the United States, as you already pointed to, we're moving toward maybe having one or two major conglomerates running everything. Uh, right now, everything that you get is from Amazon. Right. Uh, and um, uh, the- so, so again, in our economy, we have, you know, um, radically different outcomes based on the kind of labor, the kind of skills that one has. So you know, students at your institution, Berkeley, generally speaking, um, when they graduate, they will, they will do well in the workforce because they'll have a lot of valuable skills and, you know, they'll earn a lot of money. They're part of the lucky few that will have the opportunity to do something that they find satisfying, right? Um, they're not going to be working in fulfillment centers in Amazon, for sure. Now, I would guess, again, I don't know how much people make at fulfillment centers in Amazon, but from what I take, from what I hear of working in a fulfillment center, it's a pretty miserable job. So if you're guaranteed a certain level of income, whereby you can sort of survive, you know, and basic and keep your basic dignity intact without having to wear a diaper because you have to work continuously for so many hours to meet demands in the fulfillment center, why would you agree to work in a fulfillment center? Right? So again, it seems to me that um, something like a, a universal basic income would put pressure on a company like Amazon to change conditions 
for its workers. Now, a company like Apple is very different because Apple doesn't have like unskilled labor, right? Um, all, all of Apple's unskilled labor essentially is in China, but it doesn't work for F Apple, it works for Foxconn. I mean, that's a different, that's a different question entirely. We would you need to talk about the global uh, division of labor, but lots of, lots of the most profitable companies in the United States have very few employees or the only employees they, they employ are high skilled engineers, marketers, stuff like that, like stuff that your, your graduates will do, right? But the, the really drudgery, the drudgery part of the work, putting it together, putting iPhones together, iPads together, that's all done in China. So I teach an international business transactions class. One of the things I have my students learn about is the global division of labor and supply chains and what working conditions are like in China to produce iPads and iPhones, right? Um, but that's not a problem that, you know, your students will face, right? It's Chinese, right? If you work at Apple, you're just gonna be working in design and, and intellectual property type stuff, right? So yeah, UBI would not affect Apple, but I think it would affect Amazon. Right. Uh, there was an earlier question, which is, uh, just ask what is uh, universal basic income? So I think we're not going to address that unless you want to have a, just a short definition for them. Universal basic income is the idea that every single person is entitled to a certain amount of money just for being alive. Right. And that this should be enough to sort of get you by. Thank you. Uh, we came to uh, really the conclusion and the end of such a rich and uh, uh, it, intertwining again to many different uh, avenues in economics, universal basic income, Middle East. Uh, uh, I was enriched in terms of the conversation and definitely there are many issues that would arise uh, from this and look forward maybe to another future conversation with uh, Professor Fuddle. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for our um, attendees and those who joined us on the webinar and also uh, on Facebook Live. Uh, look forward for another conversation. And if you also, if you have suggestions, by all means, I put all uh, the resources from uh, Professor Fuddle's writing, so access it on the chat and uh, make sure to follow him. I know I follow him in Facebook. He does also engage constantly, puts a lot of good articles and good materials. Uh, so really, thank you, uh, Professor Fuddle, for being with us. Wish you and all your family the best. And I know that your daughter is with us in Berkeley, and she has joined us in the web webinar. So we welcome her also at Berkeley. So now you have an incentive to visit in person once the shelter in place is actually is behind us. Great, inshallah. Okay, inshallah. thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you.